Hi, my name is Alex Whitney and this is Conspiracy 101 and today we're going to be looking at Death on Everest. So this is a bit of a kind of a special episode. Every now and then we do episodes that aren't necessarily conspiracies. There are some con conspiratorial views that we'll get into regarding some of the deaths on Everest and we're not going to be able to cover every single one uh, because lots of people die trying to climb Mount Everest. And just to warn you, straight off the bat, we're going to be looking at quite a lot of pictures and talking about lots of like accounts of what's happened. And it's quite macabre. It's quite somber. Um, so just to warn you, if you're not familiar with Deaths on Everest, then take this video slowly uh, and maybe don't watch it. Um, some of the pictures are quite gruesome. When we when and if we get to them, uh, which we will, um, I'll, I'll pre-warn a little bit about some of the bodies some of them aren't it's the ideas behind it rather than the actual picture itself if that makes sense um because of the amount of gear that you wear going up mount everest a lot of the bodies just look like piles of clothes uh but just to pre-warn you um it's a very interesting topic something i've known about for a very long time and it's one of those things that once it's in your brain it, it never leaves you um and I like those, I like those things. It is macabre, it is um, a bit depressing, but it leaves you with a sense of uh, one day. It's, it's that curiosity, isn't it? It's that black curiosity where it's sort of like, oh, why and how? And those are the things we're going to talk about today. Uh, there are four bodies on Everest that are going to be the, the principal actors in this episode. And... We will be talking about them extensively, but we'll also be talking about other people and Everest as a whole, mountaineering, climbing as a whole, and um, the idea of uh, Sherpas and the Nepalese people who help take people up Mount Everest and also the commercialization of Mount Everest um, as it became, you know, pay to climb kind of thing. So, first off... Most of these are, we're not going to do Wikipedia as much. We do Wikipedia a little bit. Most of these are sort of articles written on various different websites and um, image boards and a couple of wiki style entries. And um, so let's let's get into it, probably with the most famous uh, picture in, um, that's the wrong one, in Death on Everest, or Deaths on Everest is Green Boots. Uh, and there he is. Um, but let's start this. This is something interesting, the website. And uh, over 200 dead bodies on Mount Everest. And that, although this is from 2011, as of mid-2011, it misses out a few of the uh, the later things that happened in terms of the avalanches that have killed large numbers of people. Um, this has a really good sort of write-up and pictures of the... Uh, zoom out a little bit. Oh, that's too close. There we go. Something, something like that. And, um, see, now I'm not high enough. <laughs> this is the kind of stuff that professionals do before the show, but um, I'm not a professional, so there we go. That'll do. I don't mind. That's fine. Sit up straight. Sit up straight, Alex. So, as of mid 2011, Mount Everest has claimed the lives of over 216 known mountain climbers. The area above 26,000 feet is called the Death Zone, where breathing fresh oxygen from canisters is necessary for all but the most experienced climbers, uh, and that will come into play um, a few times. The atmospheric pressure is about a third of what it is at sea level, meaning there is about one third the amount of oxygen to breathe. The air is so thin, recovery of bodies has proven impossible, and for many, Everest is where they take their last breath. This will come up again and again. Why aren't the bodies removed? Why are they left there? And the main reason is it's very, very hard, if not impossible, to remove them. Um, it takes a lot of effort and a lot of people to even get up there <laughs> and then to move stuff when it's very hard to even move yourself uh, it means that the bodies are left and often become sort of markers or, or waypoints some bodies are moved so that they're not in the way and we'll get to that later um, but that's not necessarily means you know um, bringing them off the mountain it just means pushing them out of the way. Uh, this is Hillary, 
So Edmund Hillary and Tenzig, uh, Norgay, who are the first people to successfully climb Mount Everest. Um, which is a really, it's just a really cool picture, isn't it? But there were attempts before, and there were attempts after, and lots of people died. And that's why, that's why we're here, that's what we're talking about. Sergei and Francis are Sentiev, and she is... She is Sleeping Beauty. So some of these are given names. Um, so for example, Green Boots, obviously, because of his green boots. Uh, Sleeping Beauty is given her name Sleeping Beauty, and you'll see why in a bit. And we have uh, sort of articles written about specific people, and we'll go through them as, as, we, as we come up to them. So, Sergei. <clears throat> Please don't leave me, the dying woman cried. Two climbers heard the screams of Francis Arsentiev, an American climber who had fallen after succumbing to snow blindness and found herself separated from her husband. So snow blindness is basically, um, the, this UV light is really, it's not, uh, it comes through the atmosphere and usually it gets filtered out by our atmosphere, but because they're so high up, it's not, and that can affect your sight. Also, you can go blind because of uh, um, various things going on in your body, like edemas and, uh, and the lack of oxygen to the brain. Um, so there's lots of different reasons why you can go snow blind, uh, and it happens a lot. They were in the death zone. They were low on oxygen, and the woman was on the side of a steep cliff. Carrying her was not an option. The trip just to get down to her would be a risk of their own lives. Despite the risks, two climbers, Ian Woodall and Cathy O'Dowd, climbed down to her and did what they could to give her assistance. But it was too late. Ian and Cathy administered oxygen and tended to Fran, but there was nothing they could do. They returned to base camp to seek help and report their findings. So I think this is a later picture. I don't think this is actually them happening now. And this is what's really awkward and hard um, to find information on. Some of the pictures are recreations and not necessarily actually uh, when and what happened. And it's quite hard to distinguish between them because the internet is a flood with different types of pictures. <clears throat> so there you go, this isn't the first time, this is eight years later. Eight years later, the two climbers would return above in an attempt to give Francis a makeshift high altitude burial. They would place an American flag on her body, along with a note from her family. At the time of Francis's death, in 1998, no one knew what had happened to her husband and climbing partner, partner Sergei. He had been climbing with her and had disappeared around the same time. All that they had found were his pickaxe and rope. On the day Francis died, other climbers had last seen Sergei far ahead of Francis on the descent after the two had accidentally become separated. There they are. Looking for his wife, Sergei later backtracked towards the summit despite knowing he did not have enough oxygen to last. His exposure to the harsh conditions on Everest so far had been all he could handle, and he was beginning to suffer from frostbite. That happens a lot up there. Uh, still, Sergei would not leave his wife behind. Sergei had made his way back to Francis and descended toward the cliff she lay on as she screamed for help. Sadly, he fell to his death trying to reach his wife. So, this is her, and this is her as she is now with the makeshift burial. Um, quite grim, but she is remembered as Sleeping Beauty because of the way she was lay... the way she laid for a considerable amount of time. See if I can. There we go. So, the final hours of Francis are Stentiev Mountain Ever Mount Everest Sleeping Beauty. So, this is from 2018, and all that is interesting.com. Francis uh, Sentiev climbed Everest without supplemental oxygen, but even the experienced climber and her husband were no match for the deadly mountain. Uh, so, now it's up to 280 people. So this is 2018, um, more than 60 years, including Francis. Uh, one night in 1998, 11-year-old Paul De Stenthano woke up from a terrible nightmare. Uh, okay. Oh, I see, okay. So it was the woman asking. But anyway, here's, here's a picture of her as she like, lay for a while, and that's why she was called Sleeping Beauty. Um, reaching the summit without supplemental oxygen, which is a very odd way of putting it, isn't it? Um, we'll get into some of the facts and figures at some point, but again, this talks about Ian Woodall and Kathy O'Dowd trying to help her. 
And then there's the picture of her from 2007 with a flag. Um, yeah. Which, honestly, that is probably one of the best outcomes in terms of an actual burial or some people wanting to help her even though she died, um, which is quite nice. So, again, green boots. Now, this is a really interesting one because there's a lot of... Um, A lot of, um, but you don't really know, basically. Uh, it's kind of a, a bit of a, we think it's this person. So possibly the most famous body on Everest is that of Green Boots, real name Siwang Paljo, an Indian climber and constable with the Indo-Tibetan border police. Paljo's body appeared where it is today on May 10th, 1996. Tsuang was part of the unfortunate group involved in the 1996 Mount Everest disaster, the deadliest single disaster in Mount Everest history, until the avalanches. Paljo was part of the three-man group. We'll talk about 96 in a bit, because that's it's probably one of the most famous ones and was made into movies and documentaries, um, which you may have seen. Paljo was part of a three-man group attempting to be the first Indian team to ascend Mount Everest from the northeastern route. Unfortunately for the Indian team, their timing couldn't have been worse. The weather during the 96 season was extremely volatile. That year would um, ultimately become one of the deadliest on record. When the storm rolled in, visibility dropped to zero and temperatures dropped. Separated from the climbers in his group and suffering from the cold, Paljo found a small cave and huddled inside for protection from the elements. It would become his final resting place. And that's what he looks like. Again, there is some not not controversy, but some questioning over who it actually is. Um, so here's the Wikipedia article on him, on Green Boots specifically. Uh, so the first footage um, was 1996. That's when they think, and uh, it's became a landmark because you have to go past him in order to go, you know, along your way up to the summit. Um, so in 2014, Green Boots was moved to a less conspicuous location by members of a Chinese expedition. I don't think that's necessarily the right thing to do. So it could be Tiswang Paljo. It could also be Zhou Murup. Um, Okay, yeah, it just explains why it might be that. Location map. So this is really interesting. This is probably the first time we're going to look at this. Um, so you've got... These are the steps. Um, so they're kind of markers, points in which you have to traverse in order to get to the summit. Uh, and this is one of the paths that's used a lot. Um, and I believe... There you go. The, car, the cave is there. So it's on the first step, and then second step, and then third step. And one of them's got like a ladder, which is quite hard to traverse. And um, yeah, a little bit more information there. So George Mallory. So George Mallory was uh, one of the first expeditions to try and um, it was part of early expeditions to try and climb Mount Everest. One of the more storied climbers that met his fate on Everest was George Mallory, a famous English mountaineer. In 1924, Mallory fell to his death during a storm while attempting to be the first to reach the summit of Everest. His body was discovered in 1999 during the Mallory and Irvine research expedition. So they haven't found... This is actually a conspiracy that I will talk about at some point in another episode. This one's about deaths on Everest. But Irvine... They don't know if Mallory and Irvine made it to the summit. Irvine was carrying a camera. Irvine has never been found. The camera has never been found. Mallory has been found. Um, <clears throat> decades earlier, Chinese climbers had reported seeing a European body laying face down on the shelf on the main trail. Given the description and date of the find, expert has always assumed it was the body of Andrew Irvine. Irvine was a fellow English mountaineer who had attempted the ascent of Everest with Mallory and perished in the same storm. During the 1933 ex Everest expedition, climbers found Andrew Irvine's axe and rope. Because of this, it was widely believed to be Irvine's body discovered by the Chinese. 
When a body was found during the 1999 search expedition, it was discovered to be that of George Mallory, not Irvine. So these pictures are quite gruesome, as you can see, there's a leg there. Um, so just to warn you a little bit. Mallory was found face down in a bunch of shale with his arms spread out and up. His skin was remarkably good condition, but was tanned from 75 years of sun exposure. After examining the body, experts hypothesized that Mallory's rope had failed. Their hypothesis bolstered on the short severed rope found tied around his waist. He was also found with a golf ball sized hole in his forehead, indicating Mallory might have suffered a blunt force trauma from striking a sharp rock. Andrew Irvine has never been found. Um, so this is Mallory and there is a video as well which we might watch later on. Uh, the morbidity of seeing hundreds of bodies along one ascent up Mount Everest is only trumped by the fascination of the levels of preservation of many of the bodies. Everest temperatures are ideal for preservation. Perhaps some of the, these brave souls will be rediscovered by future generations, or maybe not. The Nepalese consider Mount Everest sacred and do not wish for it to become a graveyard. Parents of some who have perished have asked for bodies to be left on the mountain, but there is a dilemma, as this is against Nepalese law. As soon as a body can be reached for retrieval, it is, and then it is brought down for identification and burial. Those too high for retrieval have the stone tombs, also known as cairns, uh, constructed around the corpses to shield these from the elements and the view of other climbers. A few corpses located on shallow ledges were rolled off to be buried in the snow below, away from the trail. Um, again, unidentified pictures of people. And that's one of the one of the weird things with the internet and, and yeah. So David Sharp, probably one of the um main conspiracies in terms of deaths on Everest. And there is a great documentary before I go into the uh information on him called Dying on Everest. And I'll talk about that a little bit more, but if you want to watch that, that gives you basically the details of him uh and the New Zealand, the Kiwi team that went past him and some of the others who went past him and saw him and, and you know, tried to help or didn't help, as is, uh, as is the case. But there were reasons for that and dying on Everest or dying for Everest, dying on Everest um, gives a really good account of that. David was an English mountaineer who attempted ascent in 2005. Sharp was part of an organised expedition, but when the weather turned and the group wanted to head back, he insisted, instead attempted to push on by himself. He eventually reached a small cave and stopped for a rest. So he went without a radio um, and his light broke and he went at a really weird time. So usually what they do is they set off in the, in the early hours, so 11, 12, 1 o'clock to make the summit by about midday and then there's another 12 hour trek back he went tried to get to the summit by the evening the afternoon you know he still hadn't made it there's pictures of of the mountain with him still climbing on it um at midday he hadn't made it by midday so he instead of descending during a, you know the window where it would be easier um again this is all very very difficult Depending where it would be easier, he um, ended up trying to shelter, basically. And that year was one of the coldest. Uh, it was like a... Uh, uh, <clears throat> to do with pressure systems and stuff, but basically the, it was much colder than it usually is. And for it to... You know, it's usually very, very cold. So he, he basically had everything stacked against him. Um, but what happened as he was dying is what generates the interest around David Sharp. Again, a lot of people die on Everest, but they don't get me the attention, the articles written about them. Um, and that's why we're looking at the certain ones that do today. He froze in place. So the cave he stopped for was Green Boots Cave. He froze in place. As he lay near death below the summit, he was reportedly passed by 40 other climbers heading both directions. I've heard 30. Why did no one stop to help? Coincidentally, David stopped to rest in the same cave as Green Boots. One theory holds that passing climbers might have assumed Sharp was Green Boots. Maybe. Um, I think when you're on your way up, it's very hard to care about other people um, because of the hypoxia, the lack of oxygen to the brain. So it was the it was the trained people, it was the, the Sherpas 
and the uh, people who are helping other people up the mountain who were the ones who stopped and, and tried, basically. David was eventually discovered by a group of Sherpas from a later expedition. During ascent, they noticed Sharp just off the trail, barely alive and offering responsive moaning when queried. However, with the Sherpas reached David, he was not coherent, badly frostbitten, and only capable of repeating his name and expedition number. The expedition people who we went with were, weren't great, basically. That was one of the main things as well. And um, he was doing it by himself. He had no one with him. And people other than the Sherpas did stop and try and sort of arouse him. Um, but when you can't move, you can't move someone else. So, for example, it took, I can't remember what the timings was, but it took like 30 minutes an hour just to move him slightly out of the um, out of the cave by one of the strongest Sherpas to give him some oxygen and try and get him in the sunlight to warm up. Um, and if you're not cooperating and you're a dead weight, eventually literally it's near impossible at that point to um to rescue someone basically um, but because of the number of people who went past him um in order to climb to the summit and come back down uh, it made news uh, after giving david some oxygen the sherpas attempted to help him climb down but in his condition he was unable to stand under his own power realizing sharp was not going to be able to move the Sherpas pulled David into the sunlight, hoping the sun exposure would provide some warmth. So he's got a memorial, and uh, this is the Green Boots Cave. The Sherpas left David some oxygen and a blanket and quickly retreated to base camp to report their find. By the time they returned with help, David was dead. The Sherpas were heroic in, their inclim in the inclement weather, uh, brave enough to return while others retreated, but it was already too late when they first found him. Sharp was last seen alive by a documentary crew following double amputee Mark Inglis during the climb. The crew were, had cameras rolling when they approached David and the footage was used in the resulting documentary see below. Dying for Everest, a short documentary outlining the David Sharp case, including video of Sharp next to Green Boots. See, I don't think that's true, basically, um, but I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. Some die in their sleep, some fall unconscious and freeze, while others, including those who fell or become injured, were left to die slowly of hypothermia. Until recently, the statistics were nearly one in four climbers dies attempting to reach the summit. Advancements in technology and experience have led to better survival rate of climbers. As of 2011, about 1,000 climbers a year attempt to reach the summit, and only an average of 15 to 20 deaths. Um... <clears throat> Expeditions are the primary source of income from Nepal, and licenses to ascend start at around $25,000. If you have a lesser experience and want to ascend with an experienced group, several companies will lead you to the top of the team of Sherpas, starting around $40,000 per person. So David Sharp had paid something like $8,000 for his license. Uh, he hadn't paid a lot. He'd gone with the cheapest team, but basically just was the bare bones. And that's how he wanted it. That's what he wanted. Um... So, going back to this Dying for Everest, there is footage of Mark Inglis climbing and finding um, David Sharp. And we'll look at that picture in a minute. We'll get it up now. Um, but I don't think, as far as I can tell, it is um, footage, real footage. I think it's a rec recreation. And... Um, there is footage of Mark Inglis climbing. He was a double amputee. He made it to the summit and made it back. And he was one of the groups that got lambasted uh, when he came back for David Sharp for going past him and not helping. Um, and I think the footage that they used was recreated um, because it, it's it's odd when it when uh, you know if you're expecting actual footage, it would be a head cam or it would be someone like positioned camera, and it would be very um, you can tell basically. As far as I can tell. There is no actual footage or pictures of David Sharp in Green Boots Cave that's real. The pictures that get used are from this recreation and the documentary. As far as I know, I might be wrong. I might be wrong. Um, so this is a very odd site, but it, it, it details it nicely. Um, this is Mummapedia, and it's a, a fandom wiki. And he's he is an ice mummy. He's a mummy who's mummified. Um, so various details. Are, most of this is just taken from the Wikipedia. Um, but it, you know, gives some information, and this is the this is the still that gets used a lot, uh, and I think that's from the recreation. I don't think that's 
a genuine picture of him. But you can see the position he was in. Um, but he was still attached, as you can see there, to the guide rope. So in order to get past him, they had to unclip and then reclip. And I think that's what caused the controversy. 30 odd people had to do that, not, ju not just going up, but also coming back down. Um, why wasn't there calls, more calls, there were calls, down to the base camps about him? Whether he would have made it or not, who knows? But it's just a very, it's a very odd. And I think from the people who talk, especially in that documentary, Dying for Everest, it's not necessarily what they wanted to do, but they couldn't do anything else. You know, you're physically at your limit. Mentally, you might have gone past your limit. One of the guys was doing it without any legs. And um, and he's not moving by himself. It's, it's pretty much impossible to get someone like that down the mountain. Um, so yeah, there was a lot of outrage, including um, Mr. Hillary himself, who is a Kiwi, who is from New Zealand, who um, basically said that's not what he would have done. I don't know. So there are some of them. Um, there is an extra picture on here. There are some extra, lots of extra pictures on here, which I'm not going to show because one of them is of a specific person. Um, which we will talk about in a minute. So let's have a look. Okay, so let's get rid of some of these so I don't get lost because there are lots of them. Dangerous Heights. So this is a Reuters graphics and this is a really interesting, now we've talked about some of the famous deaths. We haven't talked about all of them, but we've talked about some of them and we will come back to some of them. Um, the, there are some really nice graphics on this. This is from 2019 that show the, um, the types of deaths, where the deaths occur, occur and why. Um, the rush to climb the world's highest mountain this year resulted in a spike in fatalities in the spring climbing season. 11 people died on Everest in less than two weeks, the most during a climbing season on the peak since a deadly earthquake in 2015. So avalanches um, tend to be the, the most, the highest, the biggest reason why people die. Um, it is a dangerous place to go. Reuters analysed newly released data to reveal the extent of daily traffic at the summit and shed light on those who lost their lives in Everest, on Everest and elsewhere in the Himalayas. The information was taken from the Himalayan database, a record of climbs of the Nepalese mountains in the range, which gathers figures retrospectively on those who attempted an ascent. Getting the data has become more difficult over the past few years, with the increasing numbers going to the 8,000 metre peaks, especially Everest, says Billy Burling, the managing director of the database. Where there have been a fatality, Burling's team make, takes the time to conduct a longer interview sensitively to gather details on how the death occurred. So we've got cause of death. Each stop represents a climber who died in the Himalayan peaks in the spring of 2019. So this is just 2019. Um, exposure. And this is really interesting. Died before or after summiting. So some people do make it to the top, but they just don't make it down. Um, acute mountain sickness. Uh exhaustion and other. So this account, acute mountain sickness is sometimes um, called HAPE, or maybe that's different. We'll come to that, I'm sure. Exhaustion is a really interesting one. Five climbers in their 50s died of exhaustion. The age is, is just crazy, isn't it? It's quite a range, but the fact that some people are doing that in their 50s and 60s is scary. Most fatalities on Everest this year were due to acute mountain sickness, AMS, or exhaustion, one of the main effects of AMS. Breathing becomes difficult because the body isn't able to take in as much oxygen. Other symptoms include nausea and vomiting, headaches, dizziness, and shortness of breath. The majority of people succumbed in the death zone, a term used by mountaineers to refer to heights above 8,000 meters, where oxygen levels are not enough to sustain human life for extended periods. Basically, once you're in that death zone, your body's shutting down, and you have to try and get to the summit and get back before your body gives up. Um, it's not just, you know, oh, these people are, you know, trained and, and maybe they're Sherpas who live in the environment. Everybody will die if they spend too long in the death zone. Um, so as you can see, the four deaths, 75, as on various dates in the vicinity of Camp 5, 4, sorry. Exhaustion. So these are the different... Uh, Mountains in the Himalayas. I'm not going to try and pronounce these because these are all in Nepalese, I think. Um, and uh, Everest is the only one I know how to pronounce 
even though the the name of the person who it's pronounced who it's named after had never pronounced it Everest. I think Everest was the way he pronounced his name, or something along those lines. Berling, a mountain near herself. What was her first name? Billy. Oh, okay. A uh, mountaineer herself explained the emotional challenges of gathering facts around those who lost their lives. It's weird, isn't it? It's very morbid, but it's interesting and um, something that humans do a lot. Over the years, I have met many climbers and got to know them. It's hard to talk to the ones who return without their friends, husbands and daughters. More people, less time. The narrow weather window was one factor climbers believe contributed to the congestion on Everest this year. A sense to the summit usually starts in early May when the weather is relatively clear. This is the main season of the window when the jet streams, westerly winds that blow 80 to 140 miles per hour, shift away from the area, making the climate less extreme than usual for 10 to 15 days. And then this is a little infographic you have to scroll through, but basically just shows that every now and then there's less wind on top of Everest and it allows for easier summiting. But some people still try and summit anyway, even in inclement weather. Unpredictable shifts, breaks, and reductions in this wind spur climbers to rush summit bids as soon as the weather clears up in order to minimise risk. Condensed traffic, a shorter and disrupted window, as well as lack of coordination among expeditions led to major overcrowding near the summit this year. Data analysed by routers, 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 shows the intensity of daily traffic to the summit with a record-breaking 344 people reaching the top of Everest on May 23rd. This number constitutes 40% increase in the previous record, 243, 245 summits on the May 19th, uh, 2012. That's a crazy number, isn't it? Considering it takes 12 hours to get up there and 12 hours to get back from the camp, from, base, from the high altitude camp or whatever it's called. Absolutely crazy. Um, so there you go, you can see the, the number of people who are trying to summit at various different points throughout the years. Traffic jams of trekkers were a common sight this year, causing climbers to be stuck for hours at the mercy of weather next to a drop of several thousand feet. Many of the deaths this year were caused by a group think pack mentality that led to the traffic jam in late May, says legendary mountaineer filmmaker Ed V. Stewers. So Ed V. Stewers, sorry, turn my phone off. Oh, mom, can't you realize I'm doing something, mom? Leave me alone. There we go. Um, he is the one who was um, f the focus of the 1996, no, 1998 IMAX film about the 1996 year expeditions uh, in which lots of people died. Um, was famously um, written up in a book called Into Thin Air, which was made into the Everest film that you might have seen. And we will talk about the various people who died on that expedition uh, later. He believes there is more pressing issue than government regulations or lack thereof. Most teams opt to go for the summit when the first weather window is predicted. The reason Ed didn't die in 1996 is because he waited um, for, a, for, a, for a different window um, and then went up and successfully got to the summit that year. Everyone is afraid of missing what might be the one and only perfect day. He said he added that ascenders with patience reaped rewards this year. I know several climbers who waited until later and had the mountain almost to themselves. Um, so this is some nice footage of, like, it's hard enough as it is, but then to have to be reliant on other people to move in order to allow you to move is really interesting. Um, the main attraction. It's the highest mountain in the world. Everest draws the largest number of people to attempt reaching its peak. It's thus no surprise that it was also claimed the most lives by far, though there are other more dangerous peaks in the Himalayas. Um, so you can see the number of people attempting each of the different ones. The ratio of deaths to summits for Everest is 1 to 33. Uh, this is far less, than deadlier, far less deadlier than Dalagari 4, which has claimed um, more lives than there are people who have summited it. The Himalayan database, which has data on 10,000 expeditions and 76,000 climbers, notes that the, of the 98 people who have attempted Nigada Chulu, Chuli since 1961, only two summited while five people died. Five people who have attempted, two summited and five... Okay, fair enough. 
So a majority have turned back down. Um, even the popular Anna Purna, I, number one, sorry, has claimed the life of about one climber for every four who have reached the top. In the diagram below, each mountain is represented by a triangle. Larger triangles indicate more fatalities, while darker triangles demonstrate a higher death rate. The death rate is ratio of climbers who have died to those who have summited the mountain. So that's interesting, it's summited the mountain rather than um, attempted. Most fatalities is obviously going to be Everest, but various different higher death rates. Safer Summit. The government panel in August made recommendations that those hoping to ascend Everest must have climbed at least one Nepali peak above 6,500 metres before getting a permit. Climbers must also submit a certificate of good health and physical fitness and be accompanied by a trained Nepali guide, it said. Berling is not convinced such regulations will be implemented rigorously or prove successful. Yeah, that's really interesting because a lot of people like want to do it solo, don't they? That was one of David Sharp's things. He wanted to do it solo, seemingly. I do believe that someone, something has to happen on Everest to reduce the numbers. However, ascending a Nepali peak above 6,500 6, might not take that much of a difference, as they are still a lot lower, and some are, of them are technically much easier. When asked if climbers should be looking to other 8,000 metre peaks for a better experience, she added that this goal would not be easy to achieve. Everest is the highest mountain in the world. It is often the claim people strive for. And that's the weird mentality of it, isn't it? What people want. They want to to get the highest one. It's not the the act of climbing. It's it being able to say I've climbed the highest. Okay. So right, where should we go next? Yes, this would be a good one. So I've got a uh, I've got one that's five unbelievable stories of deaths on Mount Everest, but. I think it's just going to be retread in the same ground that we will already go through, and it doesn't have any decent pictures, so we're not going to do that one. So let's go to climbernews.com. How many bod dead bodies are on Mount Everest? This is from 2022, so it's more recent. Why do people climb Everest? Uh, let's change. Ooh, that's an awkward. Uh, it just cuts it off, doesn't it? Yeah, let's go back up then. Uh, Mount Everest is one of only 14 mountains over 8,000 metres above sea level, known as 8,000ers. Climbing at this level is incredibly strenuous on the body, especially heart and lungs. Mountaineers must be in peak physical and mental condition to even attempt to get into base camp. At 8,848.86 metres, or 29,000 uh, feet above sea level, and a few inches above sea level, Everest is by far the tallest mountain in the world. Uh, means Everest is five and a half miles above sea level. So being able to climb a summit is a newsworthy achievement. The high death rate also seems to attract the type of person who might aim to cheat death. George Mallory was one of the first people to attempt to climb and answered the question fairly succinctly when asked, why do you want to climb Everest? He replied simply, because it's there. George Mallory's body was found on the mountain 75 years later. How many bodies are there? Over 200. So, Here's, here's some of the names that we're going to go through. Um, about 310, as of November 2022, have died. Um, there have been 11,258 successful summits of Everest. Some people doing it multiple times. So around 6,000 people have climbed Everest. There's about 3% death rate for the summits. Why aren't dead bodies removed? So that's, oh, yeah, sorry, I forget my, my pictures in the corner there. Simply, it's too hard to remove a dead body from a mountain this harsh. Even the fittest, most experienced mountaineer with the most support and the best equipment isn't guaranteed to make the top or even get back from a failed attempt. Bringing back a body requires coordination from a team and very good conditions and can cost from $40,000 to $80,000. If you can afford this, though local authorities will sometimes pay Sherpas to go up and clear some bodies from the route. Sometimes because of the location of the body, it can be almost impossible to retrieve or would take too long to get out under compacted snow and ice. Some bodies have blown over edges or on rock faces of, or snow banks and are in areas that have never been seen or walked on. There have been a few notable attempts and successful recoveries of bodies from Everest though. Many believe it is the right thing to do. Sometimes relatives guide companies 
or governments have funded the work. The body of Gutam Ghosh is a story of one body that was successfully removed by a team. Instead of bringing the bodies back down, it is common to either make them out, move them out of sight or push them over the side of a mountain. Some climbers specifically wanted their bodies to be left on the mountain if they died. Some attempts to recover bodies on Everest have been blocked by the climber's family for this reason. Um, it reminds me of uh, Nutty Putty and the tomb that that became. If you know about that story, I'm, yeah. uh, I won't discuss it here, but I'm sure that would be a good episode for this series, for this kind of, you know, talking about bodies. Again, it's not really a Conspiracy 101 in its true sense of, uh, of what I'm trying to do with the episode, but yeah. Can you see dead bodies on Everest? There are quite a few dead bodies in various places along the normal Everest routes. Some have been there for years, some appear only after weather changes on snow deposits uh, moves. Some bodies may be only days old. Uh, Laka Lakpa Sherpa said that she saw seven bo dead bodies on her latest 2018 summit, one whose hair was still blowing in the wind. Ilya Sakale recalls hundreds of people climbing over the body of a recently deceased climber. Mark Jensen talks about walking past four newly dead bodies on his descent from the summit in 2013. It happens a lot. So again, green boots. From what we can tell, it's Tiswang Paljo. It's probably one of the better pictures that we'll be able to see. I'm gonna I'm gonna move my camera. So I'm gonna do some quick editing. Um, here I go. I think that would be nicer, and then we'll be able to read it properly together. Excellent. Um, yeah, one of the most shocking and well-known images of Mount Everest is the body of nicknamed Green Boots. Um, the body, and you can see the line going through. This is the rope that they follow, I think. Nicknamed Green Boots, the body was previously identified as now believed to be Tuiswan Peljor. An India climber who attempted to summit in team in 1996, he was caught in the part of the Everest disaster, which saw eight climbers dying on the mountain and some suffering frostbite, eventually losing fingers. There had been holdups caused by fixed lines not being placed ahead of time at certain points, then a fast moving blizzard hit multiple groups on the descent, reducing visibility to almost zero. The books Into Thin Air, The Climb, A Day to Die For, and the film Everest were all based on the event. Peljor's body, was moved around 2014 along with others. It has been reported that climbers from the Chinese side moved and buried some under rocks or out of sight. David Sharp. The cave where, was also where the American climber David Sharp would perish in 2006. Was, in 2006, Sharp was on a solo trek without a group, Sherpa or radio. It is believed he descended after a possible successful summit and on coming down took shelter in the cave near the body. Some groups making their ascent didn't see him. One group did see him on the way up, but thought he was just resting. On their descent, they found him still in the cave, hypothermic, without oxygen, and suffering from frostbite and frozen limbs. So I think this includes the footage, or some of the footage, of... that was used in the documentary. And you see, it's like... It's very documentary footage, isn't it? No one left a camera there on David Sharp. Just seeing all the people go past him. Um, in the state that he was, he was unable to speak or stand. Multiple teams tried to rouse him and help, um, but were unable. A strong team of Sherpas uh, tried to help, but were able to get him and were able to get him to speak some words. However, he wasn't able to stand or rescue, and rescue was impossible. His body was moved from the cave a year later, as requested by the family, but was only removed visi from visibility. There were a large controversy in American media over the passing of struggling climber, essentially leaving them to die for a summit. But that's not necessarily what they did. His body was moved from the cave, and I think because of where he was, he was more than likely just pushed down the mountain, pushed further away. From the cave and not along that path, um, which is really interesting. Rob Hall and Scott Fisher's death may be the well, most well known after their portrayal in the movie Everest. Rob Hall was a guide in his own company, Adventure Consultants. In 1996, there were many holdups on the busy day of ascents. Hall would reach the summit with a few client, clients and started to descend when he found another client, Doug Hansen. Hansen was struggling on his way up and had been told to abandon the attempt by a Sherpa on their team. However, Doug had been 
Early 1995, expedition with Rob and turned around only 300 meters from the summit. This time he was determined to make it to the top. And this happens a lot, I think, from what I've read and seen. It does seem like a lot of people just want to get to the top, whether it's the hypoxia or a lack of oxygen to the brain. And then they don't realize that the descent is equally, if not harder, than the climb up. Um, again, this was on the year that the IMAX team was there and um, tried to help. So this is Rob Moahi Lay. Rob and Doug headed up and did make it to the summit. However, the blizzard of 1996 had started and weather conditions were horrific. Shortly after starting the descent, Hall radioed for help as Doug was now unconscious. Another company guide, Andy Harris, started up with oxygen to help him. Nearly half a day later, Doug Hansen radioed to say... Doug Hansen had... Doug Hansen radioed to say Doug Hansen had died. I think that's probably Rob Hall um, radioed to say Doug Hansen had died. Or maybe Andy Harris. And Andy Harris had reached them, but they had lost each other. He died at around 8,680 meters. His body was found just over a week later and is still on the mountain to this day. So it was, it was found by Ed, the guy who I was talking about, who was do, working with the IMAX team to make that documentary. Scott Fisher. Fisher was another of the main guys in the 1996 attempt that ended in disaster and was featured in the Everest film. He led his mountain madness clients to the summit despite the holdups and further problems faced. He then also exerted himself in the previous days by descending to help a friend who had fallen ill. By the time Fisher summited, he was suffering from exhaustion. On the descent, he sent a Sherpa ahead to get help instead of staying with him as he knew he'd hold him back. Two Sherpas came back to aid Fisher and another with oxygen, but unfortunately couldn't get him down. There's Scott Fisher. Another guy for Mountain Madness, Anatoly Bokri. Uh, also came up to try and help, but found Fisher dead. Borkreev tried to move his body off the main path and cover him out of respect. Right. Hannelor Schmatz is one of the more graphic pictures. So I'm just going to warn you about that. Um, she was the first woman to die on Everest. And, uh, yes, is known as the German woman. Green boots, sleeping beauty, the German woman. In 1979, Hannah Law and her husband Gerhard, uh, both very experienced mountaineers, travelled to Everest to attempt a summit. On the final push, they split into two groups, with Gerhard leading the first. This group summited and returned successfully to Camp 3. Hannah Law's group went second, though Gerhard had warned them off after seeing terrible weather conditions. Their group, with Hannah Law, did reach the summit, but got into trouble coming back. Down, Hannah Law and another climber, Ray Ginat were exhausted and wanted to stop and make a shelter. Despite the Sherpa's warnings that this could be fatal, they did make a small bivouac, which is basically like a little tent. Ray Jeanette didn't survive the stop and died in the night. The rest of the group continued down from here, and along the way, Hannah Law succumbed to exhaustion, sitting and asking for water. One of the Sherpas stayed to try and help, and suffered frostbite as a result, losing most of his toes and her finger. Hannah Law died in the upper slopes of Everest at around 8,300 metres, only 100 metres or so from Camp 4. Her body remained on Everest for years, propped up on her backpack. It served as a very good reminder of what could go wrong. For a long time, her hair would still blow in the wind. Some climbers mistook her clothing for a tent and would approach, only seeing the reality at the last minute. Over the years, the... Wind and exposure stripped the body to the skull. In 1984, two members of the Nepalese police expedition died while attempting to retrieve her body. Again, reasons why they don't try and retrieve bodies. The body may have been pushed over the side by the North Coal by a strong wind, but may also still be buried under snow. Shira, Shira, she, Shriya, Shriya Shah Klofine was a 33-year-old Canadian woman who had been born in Nepal. In 2012, she made the summit successfully, but didn't manage the retreat. 2012 saw 12 people dying on the mountain, which was the worst death rate since 1996. Um, there she is, draped in the Canadian flag. You'll see a lot of oxygen bottles in these kind of photos. She took pictures and videos at the summit, but spent 25 minutes there, using up oxygen. On returning from the summit, she succumbed to exhaustion, having been climbing for over 17 hours. She died 
at over 8,000 meters and her body was draped with a Canadian flag. Months later, her body was removed by the, from the mountain by being brought down to Camp 2, then flown off by helicopter. It's surreal, isn't it? I'm not going to watch that video, but videos of her and then her demise. Again, George Mallory video, uh, pictures are quite grim as well. As one of the first to take part in the original British attempts to summit Everest, George Mallory and his death is legendary. He was actually the first person to set foot on Everest itself in the original expedition, which only happened months after months of pathfinding to even get to the base. On June 8th, 1994, Mallory was on his third attempt along with Andrew Irvine. The two were the last group who had attempted to reach the high base camps for an eventual summit. It is unknown what, exactly what happened. Um, the last sighting of them alive was roughly 300 metres from the summit, so we don't know if they actually made it or not. In 1999, famous mountaineer Conrad Anker found Mallory's body at around 8,230 metres, just down from the first step, without Irvine. Um, again, it's a future conspiracy episode. He was with a documentary crew who filmed the historic encounter. The body was identified by a tag with the name George Mallory sewn in. Based on the fractured leg bone, it seemed like he had taken a fall or slide and become unable to self-rescue. The body in places had been stripped of clothing and skin by the high winds and weather, uh, though it was otherwise fairly well preserved by extreme cold. Um, yeah, those videos you can find out if you want to. Again, Francis, we've talked about her already. Um, a team from Uzbekistan was attempting the summit and found Francis still alive but suffering frostbite only a few hundred metres from the summit. They attempted to help her down, giving her a new tank of oxygen. However, she wasn't able to stand. That's the final picture. Um, Rainbow Valley. A section of Everest from 8,000 metres up is known as Everest's graveyard for the number of bodies littered around the area. It's also known as Rainbow Valley for the brightly coloured mountaineering suits of the bodies. Again, most people die because of uh, avalanches, but then there's also falls and crevasses, and crevasses. The idea of having to cross the ice chasms on ladders like that. Oh man, ice falls, um, and then, yeah, lack of oxygen. Exhaustion. It's not the deadliest in terms of ratio, but more people have died. Um, the reason so many Sherpas die is because so many Sherpas go up. It's, uh, that's an averages thing. Okay, so let's have a brief look at the Wikipedias. Um, so there is a specific Wikipedia. Uh, oh yeah, let's move me. Let's move me back. Oh, where am I? There we go. Something like that. Perfect. Um, there are specific Wikipedia uh, pages on these. Um, again, talking about what we've already talked about, and it goes into the specific routes that are used. And um, and then lists the deaths. Um, so as you can see, 22 expedition, lots of overlands. 24 expedition, that's when Mallory and Irvine died. Um, a solo expedition, that early on, absolutely crazy. Um, a Japanese skiing expedition. I've got to click on that, look how many people died, that's crazy. During production of The Man Who Skied Down Everest, six Nepali Sherpas died on Mount Everest. The deaths were caused by an icefall avalanche. Ah, I see. Man Who Skied Down Everest. That is crazy. Alpin Ski Down Everest in 1970. These people are something else, aren't they? The people who do this. Um, again, lots of expeditions, lots of um, information about them. A lot of disappeared, a lot of falls, a lot of avalanches. Um, kind of scary. Right, what, we, what there is also is list of Mount Everest death statistics. And that gives some information 
Um, so, for example, youngest people to die on Mount Everest, examples of known cases, the youngest is 19, um, 20, 22. Irvine was only 22 back in the day. Incredible. Named corpses, corpses that we've talked about. Various medical staff that died. Lots of people. These are just examples of people who have died after reaching the top. So Francis, Hannah Lohr, um, Shira, Shi, Shri, Shia, Shia. Deadliest events. Again, most of these are avalanches. And then obviously the 96 disaster where it was just weather. Um, cause of death. The citation needed, so take these with a grain of salt, but avalanche, fall, exposure, altitude sickness. And then you've got the astronaut. So one of the people, I don't know why this is here, um, it's separate from everything else, but one of the people claimed by Everest Mountaineering was US astronaut Carl Gordon Hines, or Hennines, Hennines. He was on a mission to study radiation, but came down with HAPE um, on, in 1993 and died at North Base Camp. Uh, so HAPE is when you get, uh, it's a pulmonary edema, so fluid builds on the lungs. High or altitude pulmonary edema. edema. Um, yeah. Scary. Okay. Only a few more to go. Uh, we looked at that one, it was green boots. Uh, this is this is an interesting one, it has some extra pictures. So the death of Hannah or Schmutz. Uh, the first one to die on Mount Everest. So this is the picture of where she lay. And as you can see, all the different people trying to get past her. And alongside the trail where many brave men has climbed to the top of Everest. So happened in 1979. She was a, you know, she was a climber. Um, talking about the death zone. Attempts to recover her. Sherpa and Nepalese police inspector to retrieve Hannah Lorschmatt's body, but tragically both of them died in the fall during the track. Again, lots of different articles like this, and that's why you have to be really careful with the pictures. Um, so again, this is another one, uh, OuterDimensions.net, and again, it talks about the body of David Sharp, um, but it uses this still, which I'm pretty sure is from the documentary, so... Um, green boots we've talked about. ABC is advanced base camp, so people die even though they're at an, a camp. Don't actually necessarily need to be. Uh, Semitin, Mallory. Um, so they use rocks to try and protect the bodies and make a cairn. Again, that's Hannah Law. Uh, that's the Canadian Shira. Um, bodies move. Uh, the ice melts, snow melts, high winds, really high winds, push and move bodies around. Um, there's Francis, Sleeping Beauty. And then these are just pictures of people who have died. Uh, which is not very nice, but um, it is one of those things. Right, so let's have a quick look at this. So this is a really nice infographic. Um, this is on the... Britannica. Um, so instead of Wikipedia, with Britannica. And, and as you can see, it has a nice sort of like male versus female climbers, hired climbers. Um, I think this is out of date because there are female Sherpas now. Uh, deaths by altitude. The reasons why, where it is. Most deaths by year, so 2014 is the top. So this must be, yeah, 2016. I'm surprised 2015 isn't on. Oh, there it is. There. 1996, 2015. Um, majority are Nepalese because they are the Sherpas. And then US, China, India, and United Kingdom. China because it borders the mountain range. Again, with India, so they have lots of expeditions for lots of different reasons. US and UK is because a rich country with a history of trying to climb the mountain. Richer countries. And as you can see, there are reasons why. A lot of them are full and avalanche. Um, and then, yeah, illness, non-AMS, it was very interesting, so some people have died of heart attacks and stuff, whilst up there. Okay, so the last one is a BBC article, um, which basically just sums up everything that we've already talked about, um, but it does it in a really good way. 
they lie frozen in time thousands of meters above sea level. The grim death toll of Everest is becoming impossible to ignore, says Rachel Neuer. But when I say our sport is a hazardous one, I do not mean that when we climb mountains there is a large chance that we shall be killed, but that we are surrounded by dangers which will kill us if we let them. That's from George Mallory in 1924. No one knows the exact, exactly how many bodies remain on that Everest today, but there are certainly more than 200. Um, so this shows Mr. Paglio from 1996 and various, you know, summit versus the various different camps, climbers and Sherpas. So you can see how many blue dots, you can see how many Sherpas have died as a result. Um, yes, because it's there. Nice picture of the Sherpas. Um, It's not, it's not as good as the old days, this isn't it. Climbing Everest looks like a big joke today, says Captain M.S. Kohli, a mountaineer who in 1965 led India's first successful expedition to summit Mount Everest. It absolutely does not resemble the old days when there were adventurers, challenges and exploration. It's just physically going up with the help of others. Yep, fair enough. Again, Billy Burling was mentioned. That's a really nice picture. I think the... Um, some of the old uh, grainy pictures are really interesting, but the really high crisp pictures and film that we get nowadays is just unbelievable in some parts. And that was one of the problems with the IMAX film. I think because they did put down a lot of their gear in order to help people in that 1996 film, they didn't get as much footage as they wanted to. So they recreated a lot. And if you watch the credits after that film rolls, it says where it was recreated. And that causes confusion and problems when people are screen capping after the fact. Um, where they come from? So lots of people have died from UK, Japan and obviously Nepal. Um, how did it happen? Death summit ascending in the summit bid. Oh, you can't see it there. 20. Descending, 90. Uh, expedition evacuation, 11. Route preparation, 120. At base camp, 36. En route to base camp, 6. So lots more people die coming down than they do go up. That's just, it's just crazy, isn't this? That's crazy. The amount of people willing to risk their lives for... to say I've climbed the mountain, I climbed the mountain. I can understand a few individuals doing it, but the amount of people who do it is crazy. Again, one of the things that comes up a lot is the amount of rubbish that's at the top there. It's hard enough to carry yourself down, let alone other stuff. In the 1970s, climbing Everest was less commercialised than it is today. Less commercialised. Wasn't entirely. Again, this one's about Francis. Again, it talks about pretty much everyone we've talked about today. Bright tents mark for human presence in what was once wilderness. So that's one of the camps, what it looks like. Ah. So many of the people have been removed or covered with stones from 2014, which was more than likely the Chinese expedition. Yeah, and this is like a interactive one. Will it work? No, you have to go to the actual website. Okay, I think that's a really good place to um, to end it. Um, again, a very somber episode, not necessarily conspiratorial. There are conspiracies about Mount Everest, which I will discover uh, talk about at some point. But I like these kind of somber, macabre episodes where we talk about something like this. It's not necessarily conspiratorial, but um, but interesting nonetheless. And I think fits within the ethos of Conspiracy 101, which is just internet research and finding things, out things about things. Um, thank you very much for coming along with me on this interesting journey, on this expedition, and I'll see you again next time. Thank you very much.
Bye.